So today we're talking about innocence. And the way to remember our innocence is to begin to cultivate those times in our life when we felt the full presence of innocence. And for many of us, that might be hard to access those files. For me, when I was thinking about when I felt fully innocent, I remember this time when I was a little kid in kindergarten. And kindergarten was like the be all and end all. Because I had five older sisters who already went to kindergarten, and they came home and they told me like about Mrs. Miller and about all the wonderful things that happened in kindergarten. And I was like, oh my god, I can't wait to get to kindergarten. This is going to be so awesome. And Mrs. Miller and all the things that she did and how wonderful she was. And so finally the day came that I got to go to kindergarten, and my aunt told me, more in kindergarten, it's a German word, and it means a garden of children. And I was like, a garden of children? Oh my god, I want to go to there. And so, you know, we had this special outfit, you know. It wasn't a, the thing that I wanted. It was like this, like, really harsh woolen kilt with a pin in it. And I was like, kilt? Looks, and my mom was like, it's a boy skirt. And I was like, what? Like, how could you? You know? It was like an annihilation of who I was. But nevertheless, I was like, I'll put it on and I'll wear the kilt down to school. And I got down to school and I looked around and it was these bright shiny faces of these beautiful children, you know, a little bit older than Noelle, who were just spotless, you know, so pure and so eager. And, the, and I was thought, this is gorgeous. And then Mrs. Miller came out and she was like, you know, meeting a rock star. She was like, I am Mrs. Miller. And I was like, it's happening. <laughs> like, there she is, the very one that I've heard so much about. And then she began to sing. She said, good morning to you, good morning to you. We're all in our places with bright, shiny faces. You know it? Sing with me. Yeah. And this is the way we start off our day. And I was like, oh. <laughs> I get myself, my body was vibrating with happiness. I was like, oh. audacious nature of that which is good and beautiful and holy. We get to see it in our kids blowing out candles on our birthday cakes. You know, like the faith, you know, that lives within each of us is so gorgeous. And yet, then we go out into the world and then stuff happens, right? And we get pressed upon with these horrific stories that start to tell us that we're bad and that we're guilty and that we're inappropriate and that we're awkward and that we're odd and we are. And then we start to shut down and all of a sudden we're like carrying all of these crucifixions and grievances and we've lost innocence. We've lost all of our innocence. It's gone out the window underneath the definitions of other people's assumptions of us. It's not about God. It's now it's about you and me and how you don't like me. You know, and how the world continues to tell me how I'm not fitting in and I'm not good enough. And all of us have experienced that too. So <clears throat> we experience this loss of innocence. Oh, that's really sad when that happens. And sometimes we can remember, pinpoint the moment that the loss of our innocence went. You know, when it breaks our hearts, and we could, we could relive that. Today, uh, as a projection of that state of mind that we're in, that separate state of mind, where we have taken on this identity as separate and bad and guilty and broken, we project out into the world that form of that. And today, in the United States, there's 2.3 million people incarcerated in our communities. 2.3 million people. You, you know when we say make America great again? You know what we're great at? We're great at judging and incarcerating each other. We are the number one country in the world for incarcerations. We do it more than anyone else. We have more people in prison than any other country, more than China, which is bigger than us, more than Russia, more than the Philippines. We are great at incarceration and judgment. That's just the facts. I don't mean to make anybody feel bad, but that's just the facts. We have more people in prison today than there are people who live in the, in the um, city of San Diego. Just to give you a reference point about how many people are incarcerated. 
And once you become incarcerated, you're kind of branded and stamped with the sign of guilty. I mean, we are, we're branded and stamped anyway, but these people are branded and stamped, and it's really hard for them to shirk that identity. So when we were in California, my daughter Billy had this teacher. I'll say that her name was Miss Pam to protect her innocence. And she was like this big, zoftic, African-American woman. And when she hugged you, you felt like you were being hugged by God. And to know that my child was in the care of this woman, I was like, this is more than my mom could ask for. You now I'm sending my daughter to school to be in the care of Miss Pam, like Miss Miller. And uh, one day I get an email from the school saying, you know, we need to inform you that Miss Pam had an incarceration around the DUI many years ago. And I was like, what? Like, you need to tell me that? Why? Why do you need to tell me that? Her DUI is N-O-B-M. None of my business. <laughs> it's none of my business. That's not my business. My business is how she shows up today. And she doesn't need to be dragging around her worst hour. And you don't need to be tagging with that. And I certainly hope you don't tag me with my worst hour because I have been and done some things. You know? The people who are in prison, they have done the very things that I have done. They have done drugs. I've done drugs. You know, they've stolen stuff. I've stolen stuff. Uh, they have murdered. I've murdered. Yeah, you think I'm innocent, right? <laughs> As a kid, I was like a mass murderer when it came to ants. I was just stomping out colonies of ants left and right. I didn't know. I was just like, rah, rah, I'm bigger than you. Um, and my aunt, who told me about kindergarten, she was like, no, we don't do that. Like, that's a part of God's kingdom. Like, that's life. And you're murdering them. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that that was true. I just saw other people killing ants, and I thought, this is what we do. Until someone told me that's not a good thing. So the only difference between us and the people who are in prison is that we're better at not getting caught. That's it. That we're just better at not getting caught. And I might even say uh, that we have the privilege of our skin color. Because the, uh, there is just statistically more uh, minorities in prison than white people. And it's changing. But right now, we just appear more innocent. Isn't that ridiculous? So. Mary is going to go out to California in hopes of working with men and women who are incarcerated and perhaps bringing A Course in Miracles to um, their facilities. If you want to continue to support her ministry, you can find it on Facebook and support her, um, fulfilling her dream, but also an extension of like doing what she's here to do, which is really great. But the, as much as we throw money at that, we're not going to change anything unless we change the way we think about it. We have to change the way that we have thought about incarceration, guilt, shame, blame, and all of the ways that we do that in our individual life. So in the investigation of innocence, uh, it was interesting to me that I didn't find that many things out there on the internet. Surprisingly enough, there's not a lot of people waxing poetically about innocence. If you want to find conversations about people in ignorance, oh, we're, we're good with that. I mean, there's juicy conversations going on all over the place in the media and otherwise talking about who is the dumbest person in the world and how dumb they are and how stupid they are and how ignorant they are and how incapable they are. And it's not just one person. I mean, we can tag anybody with that. And we love to talk about our incompetence and our ignorance. But when it comes to our own innocence, we have to kind of drop the ball in the conversation. It's quiet. It's pretty quiet when it comes to our own innocence. And I wonder why we do that. Why don't we? celebrate our innocence. Maybe we feel like we've lost our innocence. Maybe we feel too guilty to entertain that conversation. So this month we're going to be entertaining that conversation together to try and focus on our innocence so that we can experience and remember the truth of who we are, the optimal idea of who we are. So it's okay that we lost our innocence. We don't want to feel bad about losing our innocence because the, the, the loss of innocence is the catalyst for the return of our so even in the Course of Miracles, what happened in the Course of Miracles was these two people had lost their innocence. They were killing each other. They were at odds with each other. They hated each other. They were really good at the annihilation until one of them said, like, there has to be another way. And the other one said, okay. And so they got together and they began to collaborate. And from that collaboration, they birthed forth this book that has brought so much peace to my life and maybe to your life. 
So the loss of innocence can also be a call for love where we're going to take those things that broke us and we're going to return them to God and have them be used for our higher good. That is okay. We're not, God's not done with the story yet. We don't want to put a period where God has placed a comma. You know, nobody is subject to what has already happened. We can use exactly what is and move forward. So, Buddhism came from that. You know, Buddhism came from the loss of an innocence. Siddhartha was in his kingdom. He was actually a prince in a kingdom in India, and he was living large and in charge. He had everything that a person could want. And he was protected. His innocence was protected because he didn't know what was going on in the real world until he stepped outside of his kingdom one day, and he saw all of the suffering. And it just broke him. And he was like, how can I live in a world with all of this suffering? And so he renounced everything. He let go of everything. He let go of his prosperity. He let go of his identity. He let go of his royalty. And he said, I'm going to walk the world until I figure out the answer to this question. And the question was, how do we prevent human suffering? Let me tell you, ego has no agenda in preventing human suffering. So that was from a place of innocence that he began to journey into this question, how do we prevent human suffering? And he, he knew that he would find his answer, and he had so much conviction in it that he sat underneath the Bodhi tree, and he sat there until, and he sat there and said, I'm going to wait here until I know the answer. And so what he did was activate stillness. All of us can activate stillness to approach and remember our innocence. And in that stillness, he began to move through stages of enlightenment, and he came up with this answer that the way to let go of suffering is to let go of attachment, to let go of attachment to all things. And so that's what he began to do. He began to move in this lighter way. He, he became a master at letting go. Jesus Christ is the same. So Jesus Christ was a man. It says in The Course in Miracles, Jesus Christ was a man who saw the face of Christ in his brothers and sisters and remembered God. That's who Jesus was. Jesus started out as Jesus of Nazareth. He wasn't Jesus Christ. But he lived up and moved into his full potential. That Christ consciousness, that enlightenment that Buddha and Jesus both activated and then embodied is not an exception but an example to all of us. You know, he said, this and greater things shall you do. He also was a master at letting go. He did not hold on to his crucifixions, did he? You know, you know he didn't hold on to his crucifixions because he walked without resistance to the crucifixion. He didn't fight his way to it. He didn't shout out vengeful thoughts. You know, God says to all of us, you have a choice. You could go the hard way and we can fight this thing. You and me, we're going to fight this thing together. Jesus could have said, you don't know who my God is. Like, you don't know who my Father is. Me and my dad are going to kick your ass because you're wrong and I'm going, to, I'm going to bring down hell on you. Or, you know, that was the song of the eagle. Or the Holy Spirit was like, or you could go with forgiveness. And Jesus was like, I'm going to rise to the occasion of this situation, this opportunity, and in, and in answer to what do you choose, he said, forgive them, they know not what they do. That's what he said. He said, forgive them, they know not what they do. He didn't try to argue it. He didn't try to tell the story again and again. He didn't do anything. What he also did, which I think he did on behalf of me and behalf of you, is that on his way to the crucifixion, he didn't make it look easy. He stumbled for us so that we could know this thing is serious. This is going to take every ounce of effort that we have to get to the resurrection. It's not going to be easy. But if we've been serious about our crucifixions, we might as well at least attempt to get really serious about our resurrections. Because we're going to need that sort of conviction to actually move past and transform these crucifixions into resurrections. And we're worthy of it. And then his disciples say to him, geez, I want what you're having. Right? They're like, how'd you get to be so bright and shiny? You know, you're turning your know, water into wine. I want some of that. <laughs> all these party tricks and all of these, you know, you're just moving through this. Like, you're, you're doing these things. Like, how do you get to be like that? And, they, and, and Jesus says to him, if you want to follow me, he says, you're going to have to deny your identity, lift up your cross, and move forward. So what does that mean, to deny your identity, lift up your cross and move forward? To deny our identity is the identity that has been put on us by the body. They did this, they did that, he did this, she did this, 
And these are the stories that seek to separate us. Those are all the things that we have to be in the business of denying. And to say to the scenario, my God is bigger than this. And then to lift up our crosses and follow. So what does that mean? In my mind, in my broken definition, I this is how I used to interpret it. That's I would I would pick up my crosses and I would move throughout the town and be like, did you see what happened? Did you see what happened? <laughs> yeah, 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 it came with me wherever I went. It was like a crucifixion parade. And I thought everybody was doing that. Like, let's all parade with our crucifixions and tell everybody what happened to us. It turns out that wasn't the proper use. <laughs> is that we lift it up so it doesn't hang us up. That we lift it up and say, despite this crucifixion, I am moving forward. I am moving forward despite this crucifixion. And will it be hard and will we stumble? Yes, we will. But it will be worth it in the end. It will be worth it in the end. So we, so we get to approach it. And we get to approach it gently. And we get to approach it with the idea that we're here to stop the crucifixion. We can stop the crucifixion. So how do we, how do, we do that? Jesus remains our, an example again. He's this Savior. And he shows us that he has seen the face of disease. And people come to him and say, I'm <coughs> diseased, I'm bad. And he says, I'm not buying it, get up. And he sees the poor and the adulteress. She's bad. And he says, I'm not buying it, get up. And he sees the demon, the potential of the devil that lives within all of us, and he says, I'm not buying it. You know, I know who you are, I know where you came from, get up. You're all coming with me, no one gets left behind. If he has the potential to not condemn us, then maybe we could possibly begin to stop condemning each other and stop condemning ourselves. It's a possibility. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It's going to be a slow road of the separation. We're going to kick and sputter and defend. We're going to come at it with a whole bunch of ideas to say, not today, not on my watch. There's things that I need to work out first. I need to process. I need to process. I need to process. And we can stand on the doorway to the kingdom of heaven all we want, processing. We can take as long as we want. You know, God's like, whenever you're ready, the door is open, and I'm waiting for you. The world's a call for love, like I said before. The world is a call for love. Right now, it's crying for love. It's screaming for love. It's like a four-alarm, you know, fire for love. Like, right now is the time. And this is not a good time to meander to our holiness. You know, this is not a good time to have tolerance for our vengeances. This is just not a good time for us to do that. Not when there's so much that needs to be done in the world that we have the potential to bring love to. And besides all of that, I mean, that's the harder version of the story, but besides all of that, you guys, me, you, Miss Miller, Miss Paige, like, we look so good in innocence. <laughs> we look so good in innocence. Like, we look so beautiful in our innocence. Like, don't you want to remember that? Like, don't you want to see the face of Christ in your brother and remember God? You didn't come here for the coffee today because we don't have any. <laughs> I'm thinking you came for God. I think you came to get serious with God. You know, and to court your inner uh, divine. And to remember God. And to see God. That is like watching a sunrise. And you guys are deserving of it. So guilt will give us this plan. This is the plan of guilt. It will say, go make your plan, edge out God, make your plan on your own that serves only you, and then when the world doesn't agree with it, which it will not, uh, go about blaming everyone. <laughs> so got that, done that, check. <laughs> it's good to know what the plan that we've been running with is. And it was just really good to know that. I mean, I got that plan. I can go with that at any time. The plan of the Holy Spirit is listen to the plan of God. Listen to the plan of God. And then as it shows up, accept it as it is. Accept it in all of its brokenness, in all of its horribleness, in all of its intolerance around it. And just accept it as it is and bless it. That's the plan of the Holy Spirit. 
That doesn't seem as easy as the plan of the eagle, but nevertheless, that is the plan. So we should know the map, and we should at least begin to approach the little willingness it will take to navigate it. In real time, what does it look like? So in real time, I make a plan. You know, I say, God, I'm going to get married, and it's going to be happily ever after. I'm going to have 2.4 kids. It's going to be a picket fence and Pinterest worthy. <laughs> and God laughs. laughs. And she laughs and laughs and laughs, and she says, God, you really are underestimating yourself, Maureen. Like, you really are underestimating yourself, because I did not create you for the mundane. I created you for the miraculous. And you could try and chase after your mundane, but what's that going to get you, and what's that going to do for me? You're here to cause miracles. So instead of this happy ever after, I'm going to give you divorce. And you're going to learn how to love. And I'm going to give you addiction. And you're going to learn how to love. And I'm going to plague your children with addictions. And you're going to learn how to love. And I'm going to stop with your world with depression. And you're going to learn how to love. And I'm going to come to you in a million disguises. Hoary, trampy drunks on your doorstep. And you're going to get to see me despite all of my wonderful ways to hide. You're going to get to see me in all of it. You will look at your brothers and sisters. And you will see the face of Christ. You will do that. You are capable of that. I am counting on you. In the same way that the evil counts on us, God is counting on us to love his children. Christ is available to us. Christ is the light of innocence that's begging to be freed from our crucifixions. That's begging and begging and begging to be freed from our crucifixions. And it whispers along the way, like, let go. Like, let it be. Let love free you from the prison of your own mind. Let go. Let it be. Let love free you from the prisons of your own mind. And that will be your liberation. And that will be your resurrection. And that's the word. Amen.